Hey, book lovers. My name is Em, and I want to talk about books and cats. Welcome back, book lovers. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I hope you've had a chance to do some reading. Anyway, I want to get right into the book this week because it was really, really good. This week, I want to talk about Darling Girl by Liz Mikalski. So I was super excited to read this book. I love anything that is based off of a well-known kid's tale and then kind of taken and twisted in an original way. And Darling Girl does that with the story of Peter Pan. Now, honestly, I've never been drawn to Peter Pan, really. I'm more of an Alice in Wonderland girl. But, of course, I know the story. I've also seen the movie, the animated one, about a million times. So I'm at least familiar with the characters. Now, in the book, our main character is Holly Darling. She is the granddaughter of Wendy, the one who the stories were all about. And in this book, Wendy's journeys were actually true. They were made into stories because obviously nobody would believe that that was real. But the Darling family knows the truth. It's been handed down generation to generation. Now, Holly's had a pretty tragic life. Her own mother, Jane, was forever obsessed with Peter Pan. And she was always very upset because he never chose to visit her. He visited her mom, and he visited Holly, which we'll get to in a minute. But her fascination with Peter Pan is much greater than her interest in her own real-life daughter. So Holly has a very solitary, empty childhood. She escapes and finds love with her husband, Robert, and they have twin boys and are beginning an amazing life when an accident steals her husband and one of the twins. It leaves her only with one little boy named Jack, who, when the story begins, is already a teenager. Now, Holly has one other child. She has a daughter named Eden, who has a different father, and she is the center of this amazing story. Because under all of the happily ever afters and fairy tales, the truth is a much darker thing, and it has bled over into our world. I love this book so much. <laughs> all of the famous characters are there, though they do take on somewhat different forms. The way the magic of Neverland is woven into modern-day London is just brilliant. It is really, really well done. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this book. I would definitely suggest that you check out Darling Girl by Liz Mikalski. It's also a wonderful tale of generations of strong women and of family healing. It's really a beautiful book and a fantastic read. I don't want to say anything else about it because I don't want to give away too much of the story. Just the way it unfolds, it's so good. Anyway, let's move on to the cats. <laughs> I have to say that it's still really strange to only have two cats in the house. We've lost some really big presences recently, and the house just feels kind of empty. Edward is taking it the hardest. He misses the dog a lot. He's been doing a lot more snuggling with us, and I don't know, he just makes these little noises like he's still upset. I'm glad that I can comfort him the way that he comforts me, but I do feel really, I just feel bad for him because, like, I get it. I'm missing him too. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sassers is stepping into the queen huntress role. She brought me my first gift this morning. She left the remains of a mouse in front of my bedroom door. <laughs> and I do mean remains. There was not much left. <laughs> uh, it still sucks that we only have two cats, but they are getting double the love and attention, so I guess there is a little bit of good in the mess. They deserve all the attention. They're good cats. <laughs> 
So how many cats do you guys have? I would love to hear about them. What's the most amount of pets that you've had at once? You can do cats, dogs, birds, whatever. I'd really like to know. I love animals, and the most I have ever had was six at once, five cats and one dog, which was pretty recent. (laughs) We were a very happy little group. We've really lost a lot over the last couple of years. It's been rough. (laughs) I told Andy that if I ever had a bunch of disposable income that I would want to buy a small farm and take in, like, old or in-need animals, because I think that would be really great. (laughs) Anyway, maybe someday. So for this week's quote of the week, I wanted something uplifting I really need it, and honestly, I'm sure most of you need it, too. Things are rough. (laughs) I found a quote, but I could not find the author for it, so if anybody knows who the author is, please let me know. I looked everywhere. There are a ton of pictures of sunsets with the quote pasted over it, but none of them have an author on it. And I even tried to Google it. I couldn't find it. But I love this quote. It has really helped me. And I hope that it can help you, too. And the quote is, What's broken can be mended. What hurts can be healed. And no matter how dark it gets, the sun is going to rise again. I have no idea where it's from, but I just, I love it. And now I'm going to take a quick break, and when I come back, I have the beginning of a new story. So stay tuned. Welcome back, book lovers. So I finally took some time to sit down and write, uh, and it was fantastic. I have three different writing projects right now, and they're all in various stages. Honestly, it's a bit overwhelming. (laughs) But recently I had a burst of inspiration for the second book, the one that is coming after Heart of the Storm, which was my weekly writing project that I just barely finished not too long ago. And I figured since I got a chapter done that I might as well just continue my weekly writing project and move on to book two. I'm calling it the Verdant Valley series, for now anyway. And the current title of book two in that series is Secret Keeper. Again, please remember that this is an extremely rough first draft. There is no editing done. It is straight from my brain to you guys. So please just keep that in mind. (laughs) And I hope you enjoy chapter one of Secret Keeper. I did not ask for this. The last entry of the original Secret Keeper's grimoire. Morena turned to it often. The page was soft with wear and the edges were tattered and misshapen. As the new bearer of the sinister title, she kept her own records in a beautiful journal covered with soft blue leather. It had been a gift from her brother, back when she had gone by a different name. These days she carried many names. Morena was the one she preferred, but the locals called her a death witch. She helped them to the other world when their time came, and she was treated with a good deal of respect, as well as fear. Her stone cottage sat perched atop the highest cliff on the eastern beach. From her kitchen she could see the vast expanse of blue, and the mists in the distance that hid the shadowlands beyond. Below, the silver sand beach stretched on for miles, only broken up by an occasional boulder or ancient piece of driftwood. No creatures walked this beach. No birds flew overhead. The nothingness stretched on into the horizon. But today, there was something new. A lone figure moved across the sands, It climbed over a pile of boulders that had fallen from the cliffs centuries before. Morena watched their tedious approach. She waited. This was not a local. Very few were able to cross the threshold of her lands. It required powerful magic and a strong will. Even the most skilled magic workers would still flee in fear. They never came this far. The beach belonged solely to Morena. But not anymore. 
Her strange visitor was moving quickly across the sand now. Morena knew the gate. She turned back to her cottage and went inside to brew some tea. The table in the garden was set by the time Rhea reached Morena's solitary perch. Fresh berries with cream, tea, and buttery biscuits decorated the table. Rhea's face broke into a rare smile when she saw the spread. Mar, this is fantastic. I'm famished. Morena watched her old friend dig into the berries and pull apart a steaming biscuit. It's been a long time, Rhea. What brings you here? Rhea ate in silence for a moment. She swallowed and wiped her lips with a napkin. She was stalling. Morena could see glimpses of the woman's thoughts. She could usually read minds completely, but Rhea was a fortress. She had been raised by the best of them. You always cut through to the core of things, don't you? Rhea laughed, but her eyes were not amused. We have a problem in the valley. Morena sighed and flopped down in her chair. Again? It's been quite a long time, Mar. We left decades ago. Morena shook her head. It'll never be long enough. Rhea stirred her tea thoughtfully. Still angry, I see. You don't understand. You knew what was going on. More than the rest of us. And everyone knew more than I did. Yet you were entrusted with the book. Yeah, great. Lucky me. Marina glared at her uninvited guest. Rhea sipped her tea and smiled. Her eyes took in the vastness of the ocean and the mist beyond. Planning a trip? Marina asked sarcastically. Rhea didn't immediately respond. Then she sighed and turned her eyes away from the mists. Maybe soon, but not yet. Morena felt a sinking in her stomach. Is it that bad? Worse than before. Morena didn't have a response for that. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she had known something was awry, but it was so easy to forget things out here on the edge of the world. She looked at her adorable stone cottage and dreaded leaving it behind. Rhea was here to take her away from her safe, comfortable home, and she did not want to go. I know my coming is not welcome. I tend to be the bearer of bad news. That is the curse of knowing. Morena sighed and stood up. She began to collect the plates, but her hands were shaking. Rhea took the dishes from her and wrapped her strong hands around Morena's trembling pale fingers. I cannot promise you safety or surety. I will do everything I can to keep you safe, but at this point, I have no plan and no idea of what we may encounter. That information has been blocked from me. This was a surprise. Morena's expression gave away her feelings, and Rhea smiled bitterly and dropped her hands. Yeah, so much for me knowing all, huh? I'm not used to surprises, and I didn't handle it well. I ran, and I ended up here. You're not the first one to come here with that story. Even the common run from their fears. This place is different, though. Fear is welcome, but it never lingers long. The choice is always simple. Black and white. Rhea's eyes darkened. I'm not here for that. The mists do call to me, but it is not my time. Not yet. I am here for you. It's not your time yet, either. Anger flared in Morena, but it passed as quickly as anything else. Emotions had little power here. She couldn't be shocked that Rhea knew her innermost thoughts. It was her talent. One they shared, up to a point. Fine. Gather your dishes and come inside. A storm is coming. You may stay here tonight and tell me your tale. Rhea smiled. Thank you, Mar. I knew I could count on you. She followed Morena into the cottage. Her presence felt massive and dark, like the storm hovering on the horizon. Morena's peaceful life was about to be shattered. And that is the end of chapter one. I hope you enjoyed the beginning of Secret Keeper, the second book in the Verdant Valley series. I am really enjoying writing this series, especially doing it a chapter a week. 
and I'm excited to just keep going. If you missed book one, Heart of the Storm, it is currently available at the end of the episodes of my Books and Cats podcast, starting with season one, episode 17, Healing Purrs and Magical Girls. I am also currently editing it into a book, so there will be more on that very soon. And you can find all past episodes, merch, and my books at booksandcatspod.com. That's books, the letter N, catspod.com. And now you can also find the podcast over on YouTube. There will be links to everything in the show notes to make it easy. And if you are enjoying the podcast, if you can give a like or a rating or share it with a friend, it all helps so much. I appreciate all of you so, so much. And until next time, keep reading.